<laughs> it's okay. My name is Sarah Lutke. Thank you very much for your patience as we are uh, navigating the technology here in this room. But uh, I, I'd like to just point out our slide is going to be on my computer as best as you can see it. But I want you to know that many of the examples are in your packet. So if you can't see things clearly from the screen, feel free to look and, and, and thumb through as you need to. But I want to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, lecture recital, Maîtresse du Chant. Songs on Pauline Guillardo through the lens of the Garcia Treatise. Nationally acclaimed vocal pedagogue Carol Kimball states, quote, as students, most of us probably came through vocal studio repertoire via Italian song, the German Lieder. Last on the list, if at all, was French melodie. I believe that French song repertoire is a treasure house of teaching material, as well as one of the great bodies of vocal literature. Why wait to delve into its beauties? French song is not commonly used in early classical vocal training in North America. It presents a distinct challenge for young singers, given the precision needed of pure, mixed, and nasal vowel sounds. Because French melodie did not much develop until the 1860s, Composers were eager to create their own musical voice by utilizing harmony in experimental ways. The Mélodie of Forêt, Debussy and Ravel, include a rich palette of harmonic colors, rhythmic complexity, and independence of voice and piano. 
How then can young singers reap the benefits of studying French song at the beginning of their development? I consider the vocal music of Pauline Viardot a gateway to both French song and voice building. Viardot strive for expressive authenticity in her compositions, studying text in a declamatory style, allowing the non-francophone singer time to negotiate the language. Her piano accompaniments support the vocal line, rarely approaching the complexity of later major leads. But most importantly, given her personal training in the Gatsian method, she incorporates the highest ideals of 19th century vocal pedagogy in her compositions. Viardo stood at the center of 19th century vocal music. Born into the venerable Garcia family, she premiered vocal works of Gounod and Berlioz, studied piano with Liszt and Chopin, and composed over 160 songs. Despite her prestige, the richness of her works and their pedagogical applications have largely remained unexplored. Viardo's published oeuvre includes songs, duets, operas, and an etude manual, Une heure d'étude, exercice pour voix de femme, an hour of study, exercises for the female voice. Her methodology was highly influenced by the writings of her father, Manuel Garcia I, and her brother, Manuel Garcia II, both titans of vocal pedagogy in the 19th century. Her song publications were written both during the time of her performing career and after her retirement in 1863. She also wrote numerous single songs and duets to showcase her students in her celebrated salon gatherings. However, as she never cataloged her work, and with many of her compositions still hidden in private collections, it is difficult to realize the depth of her published and unpublished pieces. This lecture recital will explore the French vocal repertoire and pedagogy of Viardot. I investigate the artistic and pedagogical value of these songs and argue that her vocal works manifested the aims of the Garcia method, offering today's vocal students both an entree to 19th century French melody and a means to build technique. For this project, I summarize the fundamental principles of the Garcia method and analyze Viardo's songs for compositional components relevant to voice training. I intend to demonstrate Garcia's influence on her songs, key pedagogical points of each piece, and show how they are effective repertoire for very skilled levels. Applying Garcia's principles of register unification, vocal color, agility, and a means of expression Viardo ultimately teaches the singer how to become the consummate performer. Viardo's father, Manuel Garcia I, was a renowned Rossini tenor and voice teacher. He was a student of Giovanni Anzani, who in turn was a student of Nicola Porpora, teacher of the famed Castrati, Farinelli, and Caffarelli. Garcia II was a pupil of his own father. And given this French pedigree, he became one of Europe's preeminent voice teachers, bridging the vocal traditions of the 18th and 19th centuries. He held appointments at the Paris Conservatory and the Royal Academy of Music in London. His significant treatises include Traité complet de l'art du chant, the complete treatise of the art of singing, and Hints on singing. Notable students include his sisters, Maria Malibran and Pauline Viardo, as well as a soprano, Jenny Lint, baritone, Charles Santley, and voice teacher, Mathilde Marchesi. Garcia brought science to 19th century vocal pedagogy with his invention of the laryngoscope. Utilizing two mirrors to view the glottis, an uppermost portion of the trachea, it enabled him to view the process of phonation in a living human. From these observations, Garcia provided explanations of vocal function and supported ideas of the bel canto tradition. Before we discuss Viardot's compositions, let us review how she was influenced by her training in the Garcia method. Throughout his writings, 
Garcia prioritized principles of register unification, clair and sombre timbres, agility, and expression. He recognized three registers in the female voice, chest, middle, and head, which you can visualize here from this chart on his son singing, or also in your packet on example one. Garcia termed the female middle register falsetto, asserting, quote, its mechanism corresponds to that of the acute falsetto sounds which the male voice is capable of producing. In example two, you can visualize Garcia's idea where the female and male falsetto merge in range. Garcia supported his three register theory through laryngoscopic observations, finding that chest register is produced by a closed glottis with the lateral cricorytoid muscles bringing the vocal folds together in, quote, deep contact to increase resistance of the glottis to the air pressure. The female middle register was also observed to be produced by closed glottis. However, the lateral cricorytoid muscles are stationary with the glottal lips making contact only by their edges, offering little air resistance. Here in example three, and I believe this is in your packet, uh, you can see the change in vocal fold thickness between registers. Uh, on the left is what we term chest register today as mode one. There's a thicker adduction uh, where the vocal folds are coming together. On the right is mode two, or what Garcia would have termed uh, middle register or head register, where there is a more wave-like thinner connection or adduction of the vocal folds. Garcia describes the middle register as, quote, weak and veiled. In Très de Comté de Dr. Chan, he immediately begins female vocal study in chest registration, applying the stroke of the glottis in order to strengthen the middle register. Garcia then worked from above, advising the singer to sing from the head register to middle register, slurring down. He followed with ascending and descending slides of seconds and thirds, throughout the middle register. Here in example four, you can see an example of uh, this type of exercise, the middle register blending exercise found in Très de Comté. He also worked to develop the chest register transition between C4 and F4, joining the chest and middle registers. He encouraged singing the same pitch, quote, alternately in one register and then the other with slow, energetic execution. You can see an example of this in example five. And just so you can see this a little bit better, um, he's asking that the singer sing the same pitch in either mode one or chest, and then flipping into mode two or middle register or head register. So there's, there is promoting a bit of a break in this exercise. To then blend the middle and the head registers, Garcia advised a sombre timbre, or dark tone, such as an A or an O. These particular vowels facilitate a larger pharyngeal space, arching the palate and equalizing the upper notes of middle register with the rounder qualities of the lower pitches of head register. Garcia's treatise also abounds in agility exercises, encompassing all three ranges. He was judicious with his work into the female head voice, always approaching this register in an agility scale instead of sustain. Garcia asserted that florid singing promoted coordination between the various registers. Here in example six is just one of the many agility exercises found in Très de Comté. Garcia believed that a singer's understanding of timbres and its application allowed them to, quote, maintain perfect equality throughout the entire compass of the voice. He defined timbre as, quote, the peculiar and infinitely variable character which each register, each tone can take. Focusing many of his exercises on the clair and sombre timbres. As you can see in example seven, Garcia observed that the larynx rises, contracting the throat between the larynx and soft palate to create clair or bright tones. Vowels such as bright A, 
Those A and E readily produce this quality. Claire Dammer produces, quote, brilliance in chest register and increases the strength in the female middle register. Use of this timbre in high register, however, quote, makes the voice shrill and yelping. Garcia believed sombre timbre, or dark tone, promotes penetration and roundness to the sound, creating more volume. The pharynx elongates with the larynx fixed in a lowered position and soft palate remaining lifted throughout, creating a sound, quote, full, round, and covered. Open shaped vowels such as start A, open O, closed O, and U promote the pharyngeal space needed for sombre timbre. However, excessive use of sombre timbre, especially in the middle and chest, quote, covers the sounds, stifles them, makes them muffled and raucous. Viardo's Etude Manual, Une heure d'étude pour voix de femme, includes many variations of these Garcia exercises. However, in a letter to her student, soprano Lydia Torrigi Herot, Viardo describes the advantages and limitations of exercises in a student's artistic development. Quote, one of the principal points of my method is to never make students lose their time by making them sing vocalises. Once these are mastered, it is useless to fatigue the student by making them re-sing them which are often mediocre and do not make one advance. Is it not preferable to make them seem good, simple, or progressively difficult music with words? This afternoon's lecture will explore several key songs where Viardo applies specific Garcia principles as a means to build technique. The following program will also include complementary pieces which highlight many of the same principles. Let us begin our discussion with timbres. Our first piece, La Petite Chevrière, The Little Goat Herder Girl, is from Viardo's second album, published in 1850. It is a light character piece with a pastoral topos, three, four lilting dance pulse, droning intervals in the piano left hand, and firm tonal center in B flat major. Viardo furthers the pastoral quality with the piano's opening introduction of cascading triplets, implying a goat herd tripping along the rocky mountainside. It is quite possible that Viardo herself wrote the text to La Petite Chevrière. The amateur poetic structure and reference to Viardo's friend, soprano Madame Emilie Gabo Sabatier, also nicknamed La Fauvette de Salon, which Fauvette is referenced in the first line, reinforces this idea. If Viardo indeed wrote the text specifically for this piece, it is interesting to see a prominence of A and O vowels within the upper edge of the middle and head registers, applying Garcia's principle of sombre timbre within this tessitura. In example eight, you can see uh, one of the first lines and you can also see a prominence of the A, O, and U vowels. The words are, Il est temps car la clochette sonne au cou de Montbelier. So many in there. In example nine, uh, we are looking at the coda of the piece, featuring cascading sixteenths, imitating a yodel, and a set again on the A and O vowels showcasing the soprano's brilliance and power. Garcia prized the soprano voice as it, quote, shines principally by the facility and spontaneousness of the head register. These voices are brilliant, unshackled, and striking. Their power lies in the upper tones. However, he insisted that sombre timbre, vowels again, such as a and o, created the beauty of the head register. Quote, without this maneuver, the sombre vowels, which are suitable to the higher notes, would extinguish the ringing in the middle and lower notes. And the clair vowels, which give eclat or brightness to the lower, would make the higher notes harsh and shrill. 
21st century voice science supports Gatsia's theory. Dr. Scott McCoy, Professor Emeritus of Ohio State University, notes that each vowel created in the human mouth has a formant, the pitch of the air that vibrates within the pharynx. As you can see in the chart in example 10, the first formant pitch of O vibrates on D5 at the top of the female middle register. The first formant pitch of A vibrates on G5 in the female head register. Clara vowels, such as E, have a first formant pitch of E4 at the bottom edge of the female middle voice. As A and O have higher pitched first formants, they have been scientifically proven to resonate naturally through the soprano transition between middle and head registers. Perhaps Viardot had an affinity with the A and O vowels given her training with her brother and the basic idea of adjusting to these vowel shapes were intrinsic to her way of thinking. Yet, this text is certainly advantageous for the female voice, allowing it to fully ring in the upper extension. In the following recital, you will also hear L'Ombre de Jour, which utilizes many of the same principles of clair and sombre timbre to maneuver through registration changes. Let us move on to register reunification, beginning with middle register strengthening. Viardot's album of Russian song, published in 1864, set texts by influential Russian poets, including Pushkin and Turgenev. At the time of its publication, Viardot had retired from the operatic stage and relocated to Baden Baden due to political opposition to Emperor Napoleon III. She began teaching private students, and many scholars believe these compositions were intended for them. The centerpiece of the album, Evocation, sets a Pushkin poem. American pedagogue Carol Kimball remarked that Viardot's, quote, dramatic and theatrical approach to the text sets it apart from the refined salon music of the time, and considered this Viardot's finest song setting. It is composed as a Russian romance, featuring colorful harmonies and animated piano accompaniments, opening with a whirlwind of minor seventh chords. Evocation is a middle voice building piece. With its predominance of chest register, climbing vocal phrases, full dynamic, and thick piano underpinning. The vocal range of Evocation is sizable of an octave and a half, moving from chest register through middle and head registers. With these frequent transitions, the melodic line highlights Garcia's method of strengthening the middle voice through approach from chest register. Viardo begins the voice at C4 in the opening A section, with subsequent phrases ascending into middle register. Depending on the voice type, soprano or mezzo, the pitches C4, D flat 4, and E flat 4 could be produced and either full chest register or strong middle voice. Here in example 11, the voice is marked piano to begin, with a sparse texture in the piano, giving the singer flexibility to sing in either register in this tessitura. We see this again in example 12, as the tessitura drops again down to C4, supported by piano tremolos in the accompaniment and a light piano dynamic. On the text Entend ma voix, Hear My Voice, the voice leaps through all registers, marked with a supportive crescendo. Here, the C4 Entend again could be sung in either full chest or heavier middle mix, uh, sorry, heavier middle voice. As seen in example 13, the voice again ascends through the middle and head registers, and the piano's rhythmic texture increases to pushy eight notes of thick chords over pedal tones supporting the voice's final fortissimo climax on F5. By carrying the voice from bottom register to top register, it allows the vocal folds to maintain a thicker connection, that of mode one, or chest register, as the vocal folds lengthen for the higher pitches in the middle and head registers. I was hoping this would be projectable, but it's not. Uh, so I have a very tiny video, but in this video, 
you will hear just a quick um, slide and you will hear and see, I'm hoping, uh, the changes in pitches from low to high, but also you can see and visualize the change in thickness of the vocal folds as the voice moves through the slide. Do you want me to do it a little bit louder? Mm -hmm. One more time? <laughs> Don't want to give anybody in my ears with a little um, Okay, here we go. So we're thicker and we're starting to thin and stretch as your voice gets higher. again moves from chest register. The folds are thicker in that um, chest register or lower one and um, as it adjusts to head register the folds lengthen and thin as it approaches lower two or head register, middle register. The thicker connection of the vocal folds adjusts the harmonic frequencies of the vocal sound. Harmonics are created by the vibration of the vocal folds. A singer can change the harmonic pitches present by changing the thickness and length of the vocal folds. More closure and thickness of the vocal folds yields higher harmonic pitches, which produce a stronger, stronger vocal sound. The outcome of strong lateral adduction of the chest register, where the arytenoids are firmly pressed together and the vocal folds completely closed, generates more strength in the weaker notes of the middle register. Oh, no. No. Okay. There we go. <laughs> All right. So, 20th century American pedagogue John Larch, professor emeritus of UC San Diego, affirms Garcia's findings. In his research on the physical and acoustical properties of the various registers in the female voice, Large discovered that strong glottal closure in chest register, where the arytenoids and vocal folds are completely adducted, yield higher harmonic pitches in the middle register. He states, the pedagogical notion of mixing some chest sound with the middle register to make it sound like chest and therefore blended or equalized, maintains the explosiveness of the glottal pulse characteristics of chest register adjustment. So therefore, the idea is that as we're using chest, it's allowing that strength to move up into the upper registers. Moving forward dis uh, with our discussion on register unification, let's continue with head register unification. Viardo Gentil y Grandel, published in C Melody et Marinez, Six Melodies and Habanas, uh, was published in 1880. Viardo marked this piece of poesie Toscan, or Tuscan poem, possibly alluding to its folk style. Initially appearing simplistic, with its strophic form, balanced phrases, and versus, its challenge lies in the tessitura. Viardo isolates blending the upper, middle, and head registers with passages moving continuously throughout the tessitura, highlighting Garcia's objective of register balancing. Through his own research, Garcia found that the position of the arytenoids had a great effect on the strength of the head voice quality. As you can see here in example 14, the picture that's on the bottom right is a picture of most likely an untrained singer who has what is termed a glottal chink or space in the glottis during formation due to weakness of the cricorytenoid muscles. To gain strength and tone of the head register, the arytenoid cartilages must fully contact, creating full closure of the glottis. The cricorytenoid muscles, those which are responsible for the adduction of the arytenoid cartilages, must then be exercised to achieve a robust tone in this range. 
According to Garcia, quote, as the female voice matures, the pasacho gains volume and strength, implying that both training and time is needed to, strength, to succeed in strengthening the head register. In Jonti Hondel, Viardo varies the melodic entries into the head register. As seen here in example 15, the opening phrase imitates the poet's longing with an octave leap from E4 to E5 and subsequent scalar descent. The voice moves quickly with a slight verseuse rhythm, maintaining motion within the line. Direct onset in the passaggio is also required. As seen here in example 16 on the text, Je volerai vers les tourelles, and I will fly to the turrets, the voice descends directly from F5, echoing the sound of, the, of, a, of a live, um, echoing the lofty dive of a bird. The quick rhythmic motion prevents the singer from tightening the vocal mechanism in this register. The A major section requires a more detached articulation in the passaggio. As seen here in example 17, Viardo indicates an eighth note followed by an eighth rest, signifying the need for separation. The leap from E4 to F5 is also quite substantial, requiring flexibility between the lower middle register and head register, with the remaining phrase hovering through the passaggio tessitura. Viardo's coda continues to challenge the singer with multiple sustains in head register, extending the voice to A6. As seen here in example 18, she advantageously writes for the voice in this register, employing arched phrases and quick rhythms, underpinned by perpetual eighth notes in the piano to maintain tempo. The final A6 is also set on a sombre vowel, zieu, helping to stabilize the larynx and achieve increased resonance. This afternoon's program includes several pieces that work on head voice unification, including La Petite Chevrière, IMB, and Fleur de Sechy. Let us conclude with Garcia's signature principles, agility and expression. And moi, Viardo's transcription of Chopin's Mazurka, Opus 33, number two, published in 1864, is a culmination of many of Garcia's principles. It is a vocal tour de force, requiring the singer to have command of all three registers and move in a variety of articulations, ascending and descending phrases, leaping in and out of passaggio, coloratura scales, turning figures, and extended trills. Though the piece has an extensive range of over two octaves, the A section is centered in the middle register with a narrow tessitura. As we have already seen, Garcia's philosophy is to strengthen this register utilizing small ascending and descending slides. As you can see here in example 19, Viardo's exact imitation of the original Chopin melody allows the singer to exercise the middle register in this way. Viardo diverges from imitating Chopin's original melodies in the C section. As you can see in example 20, the voice encompasses two octaves of scales and leaps on a coquettish laugh. This section finishes with a fiery color tour scale to C6 and tricky descending chromatic triplets as you can see here in example 21. Again, outside the original Chopin piece. Extended trills were a cornerstone of the Garcia method. Traité complet includes extensive exercises, training the trill from a variety of intervals and durations. Here in example 22, you can see one of Garcia's trill exercises. Study of the trill promotes flexibility of voice, and requires freedom of the larynx, both qualities desired in general technique. In example 23, Viardo incorporates this technical skill of extended trilling in Emma Moi. Studying under her brother, Garcia, Viardo certainly would have been trained in such techniques as scales and trills, but here she beautifully incorporates the vocal demands with the characterization. 
MMOI is not limited to showcasing technical skill. The text is full of flirtation, shifting in emotion as the melodic material changes between sections. Viardo's setting provides ample opportunities for the dramatic interpretation through flexibility of the tempi, variety of modal coloring, and pacing of rosades and scales. Garcia states in Hints on Fame, quote, as sounds do not express exact ideas, but only awaken sensations, a given melody may convey meanings as various as it may be variously executed. Indeed, the singer, influenced by both music and poetry, can utilize vocal timbres, flexibility, and finesse to allow their own interpretation to lift off the page. Garcia's principle of expression can be heard throughout this afternoon's program, with notable pieces including Evocation and IVB. During Viardo's exile in Baden-Baden, she began hosting a music salon, primarily used for casual entertainment. It also served as a venue for the works of upcoming composers, as well as performances of her own students. These gatherings attracted some of the most celebrated musicians of the time. Composers such as Massenet, Gounod, Sanson, and Boré credit Viardo for championing their works and launching their careers. Viardo Salon also served as a platform for her work. From 1864 to 1904, Viardo's composing surged, writing countless songs and duets, as well as three salon operas. Most of these works were written as a vehicle for her students to hone their performance craft and develop essential collaboration experience. Composed in 1884 to a text by Armand Silvestre, the duet Reverie is composed in B flat major, a flexible key for a variety of vocal pairings. Within the score, Viardo only indicates premier voix and deuxième voix, first voice and second voice, not soprano, mezzo, tenor, or bass. With both voices generally centered in the middle register, this duet easily accommodates a variety of pairings from medium and low voice types. Through composed, this duet consists of three large sections. As sections shift, there are many moments of tempi changes requiring ensemble unity. As seen in example 24, the C section is reasserting the previous tempo with an anime and crescendo markings. Underlined by a thick piano accompaniment, the vocal lines push to the upper registers, intensifying another synchronous climax. In example 25, the final cadential point pulls all voices, literitarando and pianissimo, with both voices in rhythmic lockstep, coordination here is key. Many of Garcia's principles are found in this jewel of duet, such as extensive work in middle register, sombre uh, vowels in the upper passaggio points, and a dramatic thrust initiated and supported by the piano. Beyond these principles, the singer must demonstrate vocal balance amongst the ensemble, honing skills such as timing climactic points and cadences. For the singers in Viardo's studio, this study was essential preparation for future concert and opera work. In conclusion, Kimball's conviction that, quote, French song repertoire is a treasure house of teaching material is absolutely evident in Viardo's songs with their vast colors, styles, and characterizations. The pieces explored today encompass vocal levels from beginning through advanced, and each embodies a unique character, musical style, and technical game. It is clear through these analyses that Viardo's personal training in the Garcia method allowed her to compose not only noteworthy works, but also to, to incorporate the most respected ideals of 19th century vocal pedagogy. Applying Garcia's principles of register unification, vocal color, agility, and means of expression, 
Viardo ultimately teaches the singer how to become the consummate performer. Viardo's initial aim was to compose great art, yet her work is a training ground yielding great artists. Thank you.
more chronological. So we're starting with her first publication of the Men and the Leader. Uh, the first uh, small set we'll do are from her first albums uh, that were published in uh, 1843 and 1850, starting with Nombre de Jour, and then La Petite Chabrière.
to know a little bit uh, if you found some information about uh, Viardot's own start in her vocal training. How sure. early did she start and the, the yeah. what repertoire did she work on? I mean, did you have a way to trace any of that? Well, from my research, I did find that she did start study with her father before he died. And I believe she studied with him until maybe 11. I, she was trained as a pianist concurrently while she was training as a singer. So I, I know she was in composition classes and um, theory classes and piano classes, and I think that all kind of worked concurrently with her beginning of study. As far as repertoire, I did not come across anything specifically, but I would imagine um, that it would have had more of an Italian event, possibly, or even a Spanish event because her family was of Spanish descent. Um, there are many of her later compositions that are uh, Spanish song that are remembrances of songs from her youth. So that might be curious to see if there's a link from something she might have sung or heard at her early years. Um, but specifically, no, I didn't find anything specifically on literature that she actually studied at that very young age. But it was very oh, heartbreaking because it was after her father's death um, that her family had to make the decision for her whether she would remain a pianist or a singer. And I believe Viardo would have remained a pianist. Um, there are many writings uh, between her and Georges Saint, um, and it was basically a decision her mother and brother made for her at the age of 15. So it's really very wonderful that she did for us, um, but I know that that was a very, a very big decision and a very huge life change for her. That also answers another question: is that the accompaniments of the piano? It's so beautiful. Yes. Um, the, I mean, they're virtual, so in their own right, right? So yes. these would have been things that she would have accompanied in lessons and performances yep. from her home. Or Johannes Brahms, <laughs> 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 which we've heard he is, but he was a, he was a, a studio pianist at the time. So, I mean, I would have loved to hear that, but. Um, <laughs> You know, in the early works, those early pieces that are from her early albums, um, Dr. Freitas and I had a lot of discussion on these because this was during the time of her performing career. And these initial albums in 1843 and 1850 were really seen as like a, a memento for her admiring public to take something of her with them home. And so there is a big, there's a marked shift in her compositions after 1850 in the complexity. Um, the, the early albums are a little bit more approachable. I wouldn't say La Petite de Chauvillard has a really in crazy introduction, so <laughs> it's a little, it's a little um, intense in that way, but uh, the complexity of her pieces really does push as she leaves her performing career. Okay, hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mention her sister, oh. um, who died at a relatively young age, but still. Are you on my committee? <laughs> 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 what influence, if any, did her sister have? You know, it was, from the reading that I did, it was a tragic influence, because Maria Malibran, her older sister, was an amazing soprano in her own right an amazing operatic singer in her own right, and she died. Um, during the time, it was after her father died, uh, after Garcia the first uh, died, um, and it also was that push for the family to decide that Viardo become a singer. Many of the very initial um, reviews of Viardo when she first premiered um, public performance uh, had many comparisons between her and her sister. There were lots. And whether they're accurate or not, I mean, we don't know, we don't have recordings, so we really can't tell. But I'm sure there was a huge shadow that she was under um, as, as a vocalist and as a singer. But I think in many ways, with the span of her career, and also her span of teaching and composing, um, she certainly outstretched, I think, that shadow. <laughs> yes, Benjamin. Can I ask you, 